I decided I like coming to these meetings more when I just get to sit and eat and listen than when I have to put part of the presentation together. Uh, this was a challenging presentation to research, let me tell you. Um, I've never been that good at public speaking. I'm much more task and work oriented. And so I know when you start, you're supposed to get the audience going with a joke, and I cannot tell a joke to save my life. But I've had lots of experiences as a principal and working in the central office, working in some of our North Carolina school districts. So I have picked up a few stories, and sometimes stories are pretty relevant to the situation. So I want to tell you about a kindergarten student named Desmond. I'm sorry, a first grade student named Desmond, who was at the school where I was the turnaround principal in Kentucky, a little school called Masonville. In kindergarten at that time in Kentucky, kindergarten was a half day. And when you went to first grade, you moved up and you got to go to a whole day first grade experience. And we were trying to improve that school. As Jane shared, the school started out in the 40s in its proficiency. And we were trying to think of strategies that would build student achievement. So one of the strategies we used was looping, which meant that the teacher you had one year, you had the next year. So there was less of an edge about getting to know the students and what they were ready to do. So Desmond in kindergarten was in with a teacher named Joan Hatton. She was the sweetest teacher. Very, very kind lady. But also, rural Kentucky can be very straight-laced and conservative, very church-oriented people. So there are just certain things you do and you don't do. Um, and Joan was very much of that ilk. So her classroom was so quiet most of the time you could hear a pin drop. Well, on the first day of school in first grade, they had a really good morning. And Desmond, who'd been a really active little kindergarten boy, had adjusted, I guess, to sitting more at his desk and being less active. And when lunch came, they went out to lunch. And when they came back from lunch, Joan looked up and Desmond had gotten his backpack and he was standing by the front door. And Joan, going over to Desmond, said, Desmond, what are you doing with your backpack? You're a big boy now. You're in kindergarten. And Desmond looked at Joan and said, who the hell signed me up for this program anyway? <laughs> now, that's a little bit like kids in low-performing schools, I think. They must look around some days and think, how did I get here? Who put me here? Because it may not always be the school that they know they would like to be in. So I think what we're going to talk about tonight is what we've done in North Carolina to try to make experiences better for kids and what we need to keep doing or maybe do additionally to improve the situation so kids in North Carolina don't ever have those days like Desmond wondering what in the world am I doing there. Now, I've done an awful lot of research to prepare for tonight, and you have at your table a masterpiece. It's only two pages, but it took me 20 documents, uh, 20 years of joint legislative reports to find the information to put this little two-page handout together. And I could have never gotten tonight's materials together if I hadn't had Joe's help. Because during this process, first my computer died, then my internet went out. There were many technological challenges besides my own skill. But Joe helped me get this together, and he also helped me get a PowerPoint together. And this PowerPoint is a really good synthesis of the actions behind those things that are just listed year by year on your handout. And after tonight's presentation, you will get this PowerPoint. Knowing that we have many people in this audience who are used to reading simultaneously with listening, especially the younger people who are used to reading what's on their phone or their device, I'm going to ask that you read this PowerPoint as we go. I am not going to read it to you. I'm going to make a commentary that supplements or highlights certain parts of this PowerPoint, but I am not going word by word. We'd be here till midnight if I did. This thing is 24 pages long and very dense. So you're going to have to be an active multitasker. Read what's on the screen while I comment about certain parts of it. 
and we'll get along just fine, and we'll get through this in 30 minutes or less, okay? I think it's really important to begin with what we mean about turnaround. I hope tonight's presentation is going to enlighten you, not only about the turnaround challenge, which is ensuring that we significantly increase student achievement, but it's also going to enlighten you about the history of turnaround in North Carolina, the kinds of results we've seen from some of the turnaround efforts, which strategies have worked, which strategies haven't, what additional lessons we need to, what, what lessons we've learned and what additional things we need to do. But I think you have to start with the end in mind. And the end in mind is what you want to accomplish. We want to accomplish making our schools better for our students so that they learn more, they learn better, they learn more efficiently. A colleague and I made this slide a few years ago to try to illustrate the difference in schools. In a typical effective school, kids come to school ready to learn. See that little student that's standing right at the top of the staircase ready to roll? Well, in a typical effective school, this is what happens. The student gets on the path for learning, and out the door they go. There are many schools in North Carolina like that, a lot of them in this region of the state that we live in. There are schools where kids come to school ready to learn, and the school does a very good job of keeping them on that pathway, and they get through the schooling process very successfully. That's not what happens in a turnaround school. Look at the little sort of mustard-colored student below. That student is starting school below grade level. They're in a low-performing school. Here's their trajectory. They start below, and they stay below, because the school is not set up to provide for them the type of instruction they need to be successful. Those are our low-performing schools. Kids gain less than a year for a year. They're already behind when they start. They get more behind by going to school. Now, what we really want to see happen is what happens in a true turnaround. That's our last little student there, coming to school from a challenged environment. But somewhere along the way, the school is so efficient and so effective that the student crosses that barrier and gets in a situation where they make up what they need and then they learn a year for a year. That was what we had to do at my school in Kentucky. We had to break through that. A low performing school that turns around is in pretty dire situation when it starts and it has to become better than that first school I illustrated because it has to succeed with large numbers of very challenged learners. So that is the turnaround challenge. Now, let's see if I can get my papers in order so I tell you this story in some chronological fashion. Let's look at the history of what's happened in low-performing schools in North Carolina. And I've condensed 20 years in two slides. So you've got to think big to think through this, and you can read the detail on your handout. Okay? In 1996, we developed a statewide accountability system, which provided us the opportunity to compare and to name school quality across the state. Following that, the federal government, through No Child Left Behind, layered on an extra, a second attempt to understand those same concepts on a national level. And as we identified schools doing well, we also found those that weren't doing so well. So for the first 10 years, we tested and identified, and then people began to notice that even with a robust accountability system in North Carolina and real efforts at school improvement, some schools were lagging behind still, either because the definition didn't even identify them as low performing, or they were identified as low performing and people tried to help them, but nothing changed. So in about 2005 and 2006, the executive branch, meaning the governor, and the court, mainly meaning Judge Manning, were looking at the accountability data 
and finding that we had schools in the state that weren't identified as low performing but had proficiency below 30 percent because the definition at that time to be a low performing school was under 50 percent proficient and not making growth so you could have 13 percent proficiency and if you made growth you were not identified as low performing and so the court and the executive branch pushed for some supplemental activity in the turnaround area, which is finding those schools that weren't even labeled as slow performing, but whose achievement really didn't meet the standard under Leandro of a sound basic education. So if you look at this next slide, you see that by 2006 and 7, after the executive branch and the governor's office got, and the courts got into this, there were a lot of schools identified in different ways in North Carolina as low performing. We have the statutory definition of low performing under 50% not making growth. We have NC turnaround schools, the schools the court picked out that were under 60% proficient for at least two years and not making strides forward. Districts across the state that had large clusters of low performing schools and then all the schools identified by NCLB. Now, I'm going to make a long story very short here. And I'm going to show you what happened with one of those groups of schools, because I think this is an important thing for all of us in North Carolina to know and recognize. This is a data table about the schools that the governor and the judge picked out. 66 high schools in North Carolina who were under 60% proficient for two consecutive years that he picked out in 2005. If you look on the left side of this table, at the bottom, you see how those schools were arrayed in groups according to their proficiency. So let me help you read this table. If you look at that little one down there, it's under 0 to 29. So there was one high school in North Carolina at that time that was under 29% proficient. There were nine under 39% proficient. Now you can read the table for yourself. Okay? The court said that in order to be getting a sound basic education in this state, a school needed to have about 60% of their students proficient. So all those schools, now you're going to say, well, what about those two that were already above 60%? The two years previous, they weren't, and they just barely got above 60% the year that they came into the turnaround initiative. So they were really at risk of not being where they needed to be, so they were incorporated into the group. Now, this turnaround initiative went on for five years. At the end of five years, 2010, 2011, you see a very different picture for those high schools. And what I'm even more proud of is what you see one year after the turnaround assistance stopped, which is they kept growing. So if you look at that group of schools and their percents of students proficient, after six years' time, you see a very different proficiency level. Three of those high schools now above 90% proficient. To me, that's a success story because it shows that if you do work with schools and do the right things, things can change for students. And that's kind of where we were at the end of the first 15 years of the turnaround effort in North Carolina. And we'll talk a little bit more about what things were done in those schools to get this kind of data later. But I think it's really good to see. Things can change for kids if people put the shoulder to the wheel. And, of course, there was a lot of pressure. Some of you, not many of you, but some of you probably do remember that Judge Manning sent a letter to the State Board of Education naming these uh, 66 schools. He sent the letter to the media across the entire state, and he suggested that these schools either be closed, the principals fired, or a plan developed that would change the circumstances for kids. What happened was the schools weren't closed and the principals weren't fired. Some were removed because they weren't effective, but a plan was developed to help those schools. Now, at the end of NC Turnaround, we replaced NC Turnaround with Race to the Top. And let's remember what the scenario was at that time. 
In 2010, North Carolina was facing some pretty tough economic times. And the, and the U.S. Department of Education was sending a lot of money out to create all kinds of stimulus activities across the country. And I think they thought it was a great time to send some money out with some strings attached about getting some initiatives accomplished in education that might um, meet federal government dreams. And North Carolina certainly needed the money. And there was an opportunity within the Race to the Top grant. If you did certain things that were required, you also could dream a bit on your own and create some things and support some things with the resources that the state might not have had a chance to do at that time because money was so tight. And so North Carolina applied for and tried really hard to get a Race to the Top grant. Now, in the Race to the Top grant, there were four big pillars, and one of those pillars was turning around low-achieving schools. And North Carolina had to agree to do two specific things. One was work with the bottom 5% of schools in North Carolina. In other words, take the entire bottom 5%. The second was we had to implement one of four federal turnaround models, and those models are listed there. And a school was not determined to have implemented one of these models unless they implemented absolutely every step in what the federal government said the model had to be. It was very different than what we had done in North Carolina turnaround. Because North Carolina turnaround intervention in schools was highly customized and highly specific. And we'll talk about that again in a little bit. But in Race to the Top, there was no saying to a school district, oh, you can skip that step. It was a very lockstep process with some very good ideas, largely from the experience of urban school districts. North Carolina's turnaround landscape is different. We're about 50% of our lowest achieving schools in urban areas, and our urban areas aren't metropolitan, huge urban areas. And then the rest of our low-performing schools are in small rural areas where there's only one or two high schools in the whole community. So we agreed that we would do the bottom 5%, we would do the four federal turnaround models. In the part that we got to add, we put in a piece that we had learned from our previous work with improving districts, because many times there's in our small rural districts, there are multiple low-performing schools, and sometimes there are schools that are linked, meaning there's a low-performing elementary school that feeds a low-performing middle school, that feeds a low-performing high school, and so a child has a real possibility of going to a low-performing school for their entire school career. And we all know the research about what happens when that happens, okay? So we also put in a special intervention for the bottom 10% of schools in North Carolina to try to help those central offices develop their own capacity to support their own schools. And then in some other parts of the grant, there were some other things that were very helpful to possibly turning around low-performing schools that were inserted in other sections of the grant. One that I was particularly sold on was the development of leadership academies that were targeted to train principals for low-performing schools because I had been doing a lot of work, especially in the Northeast, where it would be time to hire a principal, and there wasn't a quality principal to be found, much less a principal who had a clue about what you needed to do to take a low-performing school and create it as a highly effective school. There also was a new teacher support program developed that was administered through um, the university system in North Carolina to try to help first-year teachers get their feet on the ground and stay in teaching longer. There were some recruiting and retention incentives that didn't work out too well, some bonuses and some hiring incentives. One of the things you'll hear me say somewhere in this presentation is it's not about money. Money helps sometimes. Sometimes money doesn't help. 
and we did not have a lot of success with those monetary incentives making as big an impact as some of our other strategies did. One of the things, though, that this, and we'll get to this in a later slide, so look at this now and file it away for thinking again when we come to another part of this presentation. But one of the things that was important about initiatives such as the Leadership Academy is it gave us a stronger pipeline for principal candidates. I'm going to tell you in a little while there are four very critical things to turning around the school. One absolute is you have to have a quality principal. If you don't, you will not turn around a school. And so strengthening this principal pipeline, this is a school I, a slide I met and used at a national presentation about what North Carolina under race at the top was doing to strengthen our pipeline. It's unfortunate now, but of the three leadership academies listed there, the NELA Leadership Academy in the Northeast, the Sand Hills and the Piedmont, only one of those survives today. Um, Bonnie Fusarelli is here. She started the NELA Academy, and she has managed through getting other grants to keep that ca academy in operation after the loss of Race to the Top funds. But the Sand Hills and the Piedmont Academies, while they churned out about 65 or 70 principals each, are no longer in operation. Now, what worked from all these? That's 20 years and less than 20 minutes, so I think I'm doing all right here. But what worked? Over those 20 years, or we found out that flexible turnaround models that lasted more than one year had the best probability of success. And they needed to be designed specific to the school needs. It really helped. All schools sort of do these school improvement plans. Some are atrocious. I'll just tell I've read some that you wouldn't believe. I've read some that were done on templates of schools that weren't even the kind of school that the plan was developed for. I've seen plans 200 pages long. Nobody can do a 200-page plan. Low-performing schools, it's very important to get a good plan. And to get a good plan, it needs to be a small plan and a reasonable plan to achieve. And so in the turnaround work, especially in NC turnaround, Districts got or schools got a plan that sort of narrowed how much they had to accomplish. And they only had to work on those specific goals. They could work on more if they wanted to, but we found a very specific plan worked best. Needs assessments by outside teams. They, these were modeled on the inspections that Sonny and Ted talked about in England. Um, we actually use Cambridge Education to help develop the needs assessment. It has a little different twist in North Carolina that had in England, a little more private. Maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe that is a good thing. But getting a needs assessment at the beginning of the process to tell you strengths and weaknesses is not a bad place to start. Professional development. There are a lot of people out in low-performing schools that didn't intend to become a principal of a low-performing school don't know how to be a principal of a low-performing school, but they're there as the principal. And there's no way to replace those people. We don't have that supply in North Carolina. So there has to be some capacity building for the people who have inherited that challenge to be successful with that challenge. It also helps to have professional development in the classroom or in the school that's followed up in the classroom by modeling to help teachers learn new skills. Because it's tough to be a teacher in a turnaround setting. It does help to support the capacity development in the, in the low-achieving districts. And it does help tremendously to strengthen that pipeline of the supply of high-performing teachers and principals. It also helps to have things like the leadership academies and the new teacher support. What didn't work? One-year intervention models. The original assistance teams that you'll see were set up in 1996 on your little one-page sheet did some good things, but the cycle was they went into a school and they helped, and the achievement went up, and then they left, and the achievement went down. So you had a real yo-yo effect with one-year interventions. 
They also assume the responsibility. Those early statutes about low-performing schools specified that the assistance teams were to go in and assume the responsibility for the principals. So the assistance teams evaluated teachers. In NC Turnaround and District and School Transformation, that was changed so that the coaches went along with the principals to help the principals learn how to do effective evaluations for themselves. It's more that, you know, don't give somebody a fish, teach them to fish kind of thinking because you can't keep assistance teams in place in schools forever. People in the schools themselves have to assume and learn how to do the things they need to do for themselves. When there were too many competing initiatives in a school at one time, you cannot get every grant in the world and manage them all simultaneously. You can't buy every educational program and think that kids can hop from one computer program to the next to the next and learn the content they need to master. You need to be very thoughtful about what you initiate and do it well and not try to do so many things simultaneously. School improvement plans, like I told you before, that are 200 pages long without thinking and clear thought about how what's in the plan relates to the school are not effective. And neither are plans that don't have really clear lines of who's responsible and what needs to be done to make them happen. Also, there was a period of time in NC's turnaround when it first started that some people felt we needed outside partners to come into North Carolina to help. So those original high schools that were part of NC Turnaround were first told that they had to go find themselves a national partner and, bring, and pay for bringing that partner in to help the schools improve. We found very quickly that there were many reform partners who were selling that they knew how to help a school turn around. But when they actually got on the ground in the field in North Carolina, they didn't have the capacity to do the work that needed to be done. And so those bringing in reform partners did not work as well as initially anticipated. We also had a little flurry with the business school at UNC as part of the training for the first wave of turnaround professional development. And there was an attempt in low-performing schools to set up businesses to generate income, meaning, i.e., set up a daycare that would make money that would help the school then buy another program. That didn't work too well either, and that was discontinued after the first year. So we tried some things that were well-meaning and well-intentioned that didn't always exactly gel. And... This rigid turnaround model, like some of the USED expectations of do everything on the list, that may have had its own limitations as well, as some of the incentive programs that were started in different places in the state to try to get teachers to move to turnaround schools, to, say, to stay in turnaround schools, to attract teachers maybe in math, and then you know, you'd have teachers in math getting higher salaries than teachers in English. Some of those incentive programs were, again, worthy experiments, but they didn't pay off in results. So I want to be sure that I say, what, when I talk about what didn't work, they were all worth trying, and they might have had a positive outcome. It just wasn't our experience in this state at that time that those outcomes made a huge difference in our central goal, which was getting student achievement up for the kids. And what we need to do in the turnaround process is find the most efficient and effective ways to do it. Because we don't have unlimited resources, and there is some sense of urgency to make schools better for kids fast. There's a new model now, post Race to the Top. I'm not participating or in the development of this model. Um, so I hope what I've put on this slide is accurate. I tried to gather information from PowerPoints that I found online and for presentations I found online. But we now have a new definition of low-performing schools in North Carolina. It's no longer under 50%, don't make growth. It's no longer schools under 60%, whether they made growth or not. 
It's no longer the bottom 5% of schools in North Carolina. Those three definitions have passed into history. It is now an A through F designation, and it's a school that's A through F that does not exceed growth. So if an a, a F or D school makes growth, they're still low performing, okay? There are a large number of schools identified, 581. 75 of those, I think, are going to receive targeted assistance. There is a modified service delivery model. If you want to know a lot more about that, Gary Henry made a presentation to the state board last week. So if you look at the March State Board of Education meeting, you'll find his PowerPoint that details in much greater outline what that theory of action is. And now there are four service support teams that are the coordinating mechanism for getting help to schools that aren't those 75. So other lessons learned, other than just the nitty gritty sort of strategies. To me, the very most four important variables to succeed in a turnaround are these. People have to believe they're involved in that effort that all children are capable of learning. That is a huge hump to get across in most schools that have low achievement. I think because teachers are working hard and because they're not being successful, I think there's a development of a mentality it can't be done. When I've seen situations like the situation I had in Kentucky, where it's exactly the same group of teachers, some changes are made in a lot of structure of the school, and suddenly those teachers who feel it can't be done are having success doing it and believe and succeed beyond their wildest expectations. Second, you've got to have a quality principal. You just can't do it without one. And you've also got to have a quality supply of well-prepared teachers. I've been in too many low-performing schools, especially in the last couple of years, where they're long-term subs and you can't even get a teacher for the classroom. That is devastating. If in the middle school in sixth grade there's no math teacher and again in seventh grade there's no math teacher. And I've seen school districts in North Carolina try to make valiant attempts to rectify that by planning ahead, getting TFAs, doing everything they can to recruit. But in the last two to three years, that has gotten so hard in North Carolina, I'm afraid if somebody went around and counted, we'd find too many places where jobs stay empty too long and they're critical to what kids have an opportunity to learn. Finally, you need a little money. You do not need a boatload, but you got to have the basic materials and the basic infrastructure to have a decent school. Now, a couple of other thoughts. Most people assume in the turnaround world, this is the school's responsibility, that there is something wrong with this school if it is not succeeding. I no longer believe that. I think turnaround is the responsibility of a chain of people. And if you have a really weak link in the chain in any one of those circles, you're up a creek. And you've got to get them all working effectively to take a highly challenged school and make it successful. And I think if you had a charter situation, you'd have a slightly different chain, but you'd have the same sort of need for several pieces to fit together well. The school only controls a portion of the variable. The climate, the curriculum daily, what training the teachers are going to get, how the, the school interacts with the community and parents, and the management of allocated resources. Some of the most critical variables are controlled by the district. The district determines who will be the principal. So if a superintendent does not have good judgment about who can turn a school around and sends an ineffective principal to the board, then that school's stuck right there. Or if the superintendent is a wise person and sends an excellent candidate to the board and the board resists and tries to put in someone that's a friend or a fraternity brother or a neighbor, things can go wrong there. It's a fragile process. 
But who will be the principal is a very, very important question. Who will support the principal? You know, most of these turnaround schools are getting first-year principals. There are not a lot of people who've already done a turnaround out there to be hired in these low-performing districts that offer the lowest salaries. So somebody's got to support that person, and that's usually somebody in the central office. So that person has to have some understanding of the role of the central office in making sure principals succeed. And not have the understanding that it's the role of the central office to say no to everything the principal asks for, okay? The teacher hiring process is critical, absolutely critical, because that supply of teachers and getting those effective teachers is important. And once you get a teacher in there, there's a lot of research now that says if the teacher's ineffective, get them out fast, because a new teacher has a better chance of helping a student in a turnaround situation than a teacher that's ineffective. And so it's very important that there be systems to look carefully at how teachers are doing and make some very critical decisions early on about who's got a contract to teach in a low-performing school. That's hard to do when you don't even have enough teachers to fill the classrooms. Budget and allocation of resources comes from the central office. You know, if all the schools in your district are low-performing or almost all, you're spreading that money out very equally. If you're a wealthy district and you're spreading the money out equally and not giving a little bit of a boost to the challenge school, you may not have the most effective allocation of resources. Districts often have their own accountability systems for benchmarking. They set the policies about suspension and attendance. Oh boy, are they important in a turnaround environment. And school hours and calendar. You know, extra time often helps in a turnaround situation. But if you don't have a good bus plan that gives those schools extra time, you've got another issue that can only be controlled at the district level. The state also has an important role. Many things the state does. I'll let you read those for yourself. And you'll have access to this PowerPoint. And you can look and reflect on what I've said later. But the state has a key role. The state cannot walk away from this. In North Carolina, our students have a constitutional right to a sound basic education. And there's a real question about whether or not low-performing schools meet that test. All right, the other thing, the pressure to motivate school improvement has to be balanced by the support. NCLB didn't work. It was more about sanctions and corrective action there was not a good plan coming with it to help schools accomplish what the federal government wanted them to accomplish. Big influence fluxes of money may be short-term fixes, but they aren't sustainable. You know, we've had some large school improvement grants, millions. I've seen schools with school improvement grants get almost enough money to pay tuition for kids at Harvard per child. And yet three years later, there's no sustained improvement. It may have been good for those kids at that time, and that's good, but you want it to be good for kids over time. The definition of low-performing matters. I think as we get to our study group research, we need to struggle a little bit about what is a good definition in North Carolina. Is our current definition all it should be? There has to be a match between the definition and the scope for the resources. Gary Henry's study that many of you who were at his presentation at the museum also found that in some of our low-performing districts where they're sort of at the bottom of our resources in the state, turnaround efforts may need to be sustained over time because these districts are in such churn. You may bring in a principal, you may get that principal trained, but before you turn around, that principal's gone to Wake County or Charlotte-Mecklenburg, and that smaller rural district starts again. Same for teachers. Basing the evaluation of turnaround efforts on averages may not be the best way to evaluate turnaround. We've had a lot of studies in North Carolina showing that we've done some things well. We've got a study coming soon that may say, oops, some things don't look as well. I worry about how we're evaluating turnaround, though. Because in those schools that we looked at on that bar chart, 
If you were a school that got above 90% proficient, some things worked really right. But if you were in one of those schools that after six years, you were still below that 60% mark, a lot of time and effort went down the drain. When you average that together, I'm not sure it tells the whole story. I think especially for schools that have resources and help and nothing changes, there needs to be in our North Carolina model some kind of very direct, very public inspection of what didn't work and why. Because I think the kids in that school district deserve that. And we can all learn from it and we can make it better. So I don't think averaging it together is the way to go. I think looking really specifically at each school, what worked, what didn't work, and outlining why and being very concrete about that would help us more in using evaluation to improve turnaround. Looking ahead, this is the task before us. In North Carolina, for low-performing schools, even though we've changed these over time, we've got a definition and an identification mechanism. We have a theory of action. It's changed four or five times in 20 years, but we've had one. We have strategies about what works, what doesn't work. And we have some accumulated knowledge and history. Our risk is, I think people sometimes forget what's been done in the past, and they, we go back and cycle and try some of the same things over again because we change people and we lose our historical knowledge. We have some allocated resources. The question is, do we have a match between the problem as we've defined it with 581 schools and the resources we've allocated to solve the problem? So we have to ask ourselves, are 23% of the schools in North Carolina at this time truly low performing? If we believe that, then how are we going to attend to that in resources? Or have we over-identified and do we need to tweak things and improve them in some way? But the biggest question I think we all have to ask ourselves as we work in this study group is, do we have a comprehensive, commonly agreed upon plan in the state at this time that ensures the opportunity for all our students to have a sound basic education? North Carolina has been struggling with that problem over a long period of time. Personally, I'd like to see us get an answer to it. And I'm hopeful that at some point we will. So there you go, 20, 20 years of North Carolina turnaround in a synthesis. I hope some of this was helpful.